Okay, good morning everyone in Hazak Baruch. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Friday morning, Erev Shabbat Kodesh. Today's class is sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shlema of all of Am Yisrael. Hashem should bless all of our sponsors always with continued success and growth. Nahat from the children to be able to always be on the giving end of life. Amen. Rabotai, Chanukah is upon us <clears throat> just uh, another week or so and we'll be lighting the candles. And I'd like to share with you an idea from Rabbi Bernstein over here on the concept of the Galut of Yavan. We know that as a nation we endured four Galuyot. We endured four exiles. We're actually still in the fourth one. And the four Galuyot, and people wonder why is it Mitzrayim counted as one of them? Because that happened before we were a nation. But it's a good question. And uh, after we got the Torah and we went into the land, we had four exiles. And we know that the four, again quickly, were Bavel, who destroyed the first temple, Nebuchadnezzar. The second one was outside of Israel when we were already conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. Then Persia, or Paras slash Madai, conquered them. And then we switched from Bavel enemy to Paras enemy. That was the story of Purim in Persia. <coughs> Great neck for those that now live in Great Neck, all the Persians. <laughs> then you have the story of Yavan, Chanukah. That's the third one, Yavan. And the fourth one is, is uh, Rome, the West, that we're in right now still. And our rabbis point out that these four exiles actually are hinted to right in the beginning of the Torah. We know the Torah begins, Bereshit bara Elohim et In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was all, right, lacking order, chaos. Mishkebabel, as we say. That's what the Pasuk says. And Rish Lakish, the Gemara, the Midrash, comes along and says the following. The world is going to be desolate, is alluding to the Galut of Bavel. Vohu, empty is Galut Madai. Choshech, Zo Galut Yavan. And Tehom is the Galut of, that we're in right now, that seems as if it has no end. And over here, what the Midrash is telling us is the Galut of Chanukah, the exile of Chanukah that we're going to commemorate, actually uh, is referred to by the word darkness. And we must ask a question, isn't Galut by definition dark? I mean, aren't all Galuyot dark? Isn't that just the simple, basic, minimum? The, the minimum description of exile is that it's a dark period in history. So to say that Yavan is dark seems like you didn't add anything that we didn't already know. They're all dark. In what way is the exile of Yavan even darker than the other exiles? of Bavel and Purim and, and the one that we're in right now. This needs to be really understood because um, it seems like we're not adding anything, any deeper layer, deeper understanding. By calling it dark, it's like, okay, we're, you know, it's like sometimes a rabbi gets up at a, at a wedding ceremony and he speaks about the Chatan and Kala and you can tell that he has nothing uh, special to say. So he's just using the generic, you know, Oh, the Chatan is very, right? And you could tell he just, you know, he just Googled nice uh, qualities, virtues, and he's just reading them off of Google. So it seems like when we say that Greece was dark, okay, is there anything more? They're all dark. We knew that already, They're by definition, right? When you tell me that Rome is deep, that's giving me an insight. Deep is never ending. The one that we're in, it seems like it's never going to end. So that's an, that you're adding over here. But what does it mean that Yavan is dark? Well, really, when you think about it for a minute, to talk about Galut of Chanukah, it's hard to really talk about it. for Because if you think about it, Chanukah, where did it take place? Which country were the Jewish people in during the period of Chanukah? We were in Israel, 
right? Actually, it's the only Galut that we weren't out of the land of Israel. Actually, in a way, if you think about it, you may wonder if it's a Galut at all, because we weren't exiled. We were in Israel. Bavel, we were kicked out. We were taken in shackles. Uh, Purim, we were, it happened in, in Persia. Uh, Romi happens now in Chutz Aretz. But Yavan, Chanukah, happened in Israel. What kind of Galut is this? So Rabbi Bernstein explains there are two types of Galuyot. There's a geographical and there's a spiritual. You see, Galut really just means to be far from. A geographical Galut is that I'm far from Israel. But a spiritual Galut is where I'm far from Hashem. And actually we find that the five books of the Torah, Bereshit, Shemot, Vaikra, Bamibar, Dvarim, each one is given a name. Bereshit, we call it the book of Genesis. But it's actually, right, Exodus, Leviticus. That's what they're called in English. That actually comes from our Rishonim. They're the ones that coined these terms. When they gave the first book, the name, the book of uh, Sefer, right, Yetzira, the book of creation, or the Chumash, or the book of, uh, the second one is Geula, Exodus. The third one is Torah Kohanim, Leviticus, uh, Pekudim, Numbers, or Mishneh Torah, Deuteronomy, Du, Two, Second, the Second Torah, the Second, the Recap. The Ramban explains why does the book of Shemot end where it ends? If it's a book of Exodus, if it's a book of, of uh, you know, redemption, shouldn't it ha- shouldn't, aren't we redeemed when we come into the land of Israel? Explains the Ramban that there's two types of redemption. There's a geographical and there's a spiritual. And so although we weren't in the land of Israel, but by having the Mishkan, we were now connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and we're spiritually redeemed. And that's enough of a reason to end the book right here, he, he says, at the end of Shemot. Beautiful idea. So Greek, the Galut of Hanukkah, was the second type. It was a spiritual exile. And what did the Greeks want? What was the problem? The Greeks taught in really one sentence. Their philosophy was, that all of life's problems, every issue that you will ever have, anything that you'll ever need to know, you can conclude, you can come, you could derive by just using your brain. Use your logic, your brain, your understanding, and that's it. You should live your life based on how you think, on what makes sense to you, because ultimately, what could be greater than man's intellect? We are the smartest source of wisdom that that exists. That's what the Greeks taught. It's all about how you feel. It's a very big word today, how you feel. No one cares about higher feelings or higher facts or biology or science. We don't care about that. We care about how you feel. That's That's what the Greeks taught. Greece came and said, man is the final arbiter of truth. And as Jews, we believe something very different. We agree that man has a brain and man should use it, but ultimately man must surrender his knowledge, his understanding to that of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to a higher source. We believe that the Torah is even smarter than man's intellect. There's a, and the highest, the highest source of wisdom is God's. Really, this is Akedat Yitzchak. Avraham Avinu, when he's told to sacrifice his son, in his mind, it made no sense. Why would I do that? It makes no sense to me. And the power of Akedah was that Abraham was able to put aside his intellect, to put aside his understanding, to put aside all of his reason and logic, and to say, although to me it makes no sense, but I surrender to God's logic. And if this is what he wants, then I'll do it. And that way requires a lot of humility. It takes a lot of humility to put aside my own calculations for God's. Right? The first way, the way of the Greeks, it talks very much to man's ego. I know. I think. Right? That's why it's so hard for us as, in general as people to apologize. Apologize? For who? For what? You? I should apologize to you? I know better than you. You apologize to me. If I think this, 
I'm right. It's very hard for us to admit that we're wrong. Because that means that we don't that means that something's wrong with our brain, with our faculty of, of thinking. So life, life is really about us surrendering our logic to God. This is uh, this is what the Torah is all about. Being able to use our brain, but when it comes to a point that it makes no sense to be able to say, God, now I surrender to you. Right? Really. Emunah begins where our understanding ends. That's the idea in one sentence. Emunah begins where our understanding ends. God, it doesn't make any sense to me, and therefore now I hand it over to you. Pasuk says, writes in Kohelet, I perceived that there is advantage to wisdom over folly as the advantage of light over darkness. So we hear Shlomo HaMelech is saying that there's a connection between logic and light. Right? And each, and one more time. I find that there's an advantage to Chokhmah over folly, just like Yitron over, uh, just like the Or over darkness, light over darkness. So he's comparing logic and wisdom to light. And he's comparing foolishness to darkness. Very interesting that by creation, when God created the world, the Pasuk says, God called the day, uh, the light, day. And the darkness, he called night. It doesn't say God called night. It says he. God doesn't associate with dark. Even though he's the creator of dark. But he doesn't associate with dark. Shomo Melech is maybe saying, says the Gaon Mevilna, that God, so just like God doesn't associate with dark, so too, in order to have true knowledge, knowledge, real knowledge, is only when it's attached to the source, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Ata honen la'adam da'at. God, right? All wisdom, all da'at comes from you. And there's two reasons why we have to be able to surrender and attach our wisdom to God. Number one, there's many things that we don't understand. You know, our intellect is very limited. We could only see a part of the equation. You know, 500 years ago, 200 years ago, a person never fathomed that there'll be such a thing as a flying item in the, in the sky. Fly, a boat flying? It's impossible. How are you going to do that? And if someone would have said that, man's intellect couldn't perceive it, couldn't comprehend Today, what do you mean? Today, if your flight's delayed <laughs> by five minutes, you're very annoyed. Go faster, airplane, right? So what's the difference between 200 years ago and now? The world didn't change, right? But things, things are unimaginable until, they're actually, until they happen. So we're very limited in how we think and how we understand. There's only so much that we can know. There's only so much that we can see. Technology, the idea that there's, uh, you know, radio waves in the air, we can't see that. So if I can't see it, then obviously it's not there. It can't be true. But that's only, that's only because man's limited. So number one, when the Torah, when God, who could see more than us, says something, we'd be very wise to pay attention to that. Right? Um, for those that have been stuck in traffic and sometimes the ways will tell you to take another route. Right? Alternate route. And uh, with your eyes, your limited eyes, you see the way that ways wants you to go. It doesn't look so promising. That way is even more traffic. And the guy who decides to listen to himself sits in traffic for another two hours. Sometimes you listen to the ways and then you go there and it looks like it's traffic also even more traffic, but then down the road it clears up and then you're going there and you get to your destination. Because the ways, what's the difference between you and the ways? Are you smarter than way? Are, is ways smarter than you? Can you see? The answer is it could see from, from a higher, right? It could see the whole picture. So number one, number one, there's much more to, to life than we can see and that we can understand.
But number two, it's also really to realize and appreciate this very important point. What is the goal? What is the purpose of wisdom? We use wisdom for what? Going back to yesterday's class, that everything in life must have a higher means to an end. Wisdom, to just have wisdom in a vacuum is pointless. If the wisdom is used, if it's not used to lead to something greater, if you're using your wisdom, what are you using your knowledge for? If you're using it to just, you know, play a game, that's point. That's that's a waste of, of brain cells, right? A person's brain, intellect is supposed to lead him to a higher understanding and connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So this is the difference between us and the Greeks. We both value wisdom. Only thing is, they felt that that was the final say and we realized that there's one thing higher and that is God. God's wisdom. God's intellect. There is a sad day on the Jewish calendar called the Septuagint. It's a day that the king of Talmai sat 70 rabbis, some say 72. He sat 70 rabbis in, a, in separate rooms and he made them translate the Torah into Greek. It was a very sad day that the rabbis even made it a day of fasting. It's the 8th of Tevet. Today we don't fast on that day. Some do. But we remove that day from the obligations of fasting. But it's brought down and it's a sad day. Because he made us translate the Torah. We wonder why is that such a sad day? I mean, don't we translate the Torah into English today? It's a very good thing. Many people text me, Rabbi, do you know a good translation that I could buy? What's wrong with translating the Torah? Nothing wrong with translating. The difference is that King Talmai didn't translate the Torah in order for him to learn from it. He translated the Torah so that he can evaluate whether it was right or wrong. When we become the judge, and that's a big uh, word this week, Aaron Judge, Mazal Tov to Aaron Judge, 300 and uh, how many million dollars? <laughs> Hazak Baruch. If you want to send a ma'asir to the synagogue, we'll accept it. But either way, we'll take a fraction of ma'asir also, no problem. But either way, when we become the judge of what's right and wrong, when we evaluate if the Torah is correct, if it makes sense, then I guess I'll follow it. That's, that's very, very, very sad. That's a day of fasting. That's a reason to mourn. We believe that not, not, we, don't, we don't evaluate the Torah. The Torah evaluates us. We read the Torah, and if something doesn't make sense, the problem is Banu. The problem is in here. The problem is in this. The problem is not in the Torah. Torah is perfect. Matter of fact, matter of fact, Antiochus came just a generation later after Talmai and he banned the Torah altogether. That's very extreme. First you want to translate it into your language and now you want to ban it? That's not extreme at all. They both had the same motivation. Bo both of their goals were to get rid of it. He had his way and he had his way. He, he wanted to translate it to neutralize and he realized that it wasn't working, so let's get rid of it altogether. You know, I was, uh, as a kid, we used to go to the Liberty Science Center. As, uh, you know, my parents used to take us for different trips, Liberty Science, you guys remember that? Liberty Science Center. Anyways, I remember when I was there, there was this thing called the Black Tunnel. We had to crawl through a tunnel in the dark. You couldn't see. You had to use your hands to get through the tunnel. You crawled through. A few weeks ago, I took my kids, not to the Liberty Science Center, but I took them to the American Dream. The American Dream Mall. Anyone heard of that? Anyone been there? They've been begging, begging, begging. And it's actually a pretty cool story how I got the tickets. The day that we were, the next day we were gonna go, and all of a sudden, it's a real story. I told my wife, look at the tickets. We were gonna surprise my son, Benny, for his 10th birthday. He was turning 10, October 26. So the day before, I texted my wife, Look into tickets, let's take the kids tomorrow after school to the American Dream, to the amusement park. Anyways, that day in the shul, Tuesday night, the night before, a man walks in. He says, are you Rabbi Mizrahi? I said, yes. He said, oh, okay, I wanted to speak to you. I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking, I'm, I have a message from a man, Don Germazian. Do you know who Don Germazian is? I'm like, Don Germazian, no, who is that? He's like, you know, he's the guy who owns the American Dream. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow. He's like, have you ever been? He's like, I, actually, I'm like, no, I plan on going tomorrow. He's like, one second. He gets my number. A few minutes later, I have five tickets to the American Dream Wall in my uh, email. 
<laughs> so Hashem has a very interesting small world. But the truth is, it's a big world, very well, very well managed. Anyways, when we were there, we went through this thing called the mirror maze. The mirror maze reminded me of the black tunnel. But instead of it being dark, it's just mirrors. And you could see, but it's all mirrored, different angles, tricking you. Which one would you say is harder, the black tunnel or the mirror maze? And why? So my friends listen to this idea. It's my own it's my own mashal, but the point is what it, we're trying to say over here today. Much more dangerous to be in a mirror maze. Because when you're in a black tunnel, you know it's black, you know you can't see. You know you need help. You know not to rely on what you see, rely on what you can feel. When you're in a mirror maze, you think that you can see. Your eyes can fool you because you see. And it looks like right there, I see the exit sign. It's much more dangerous when you think you can see. Because my friends, there's something darker than dark. It's dark. But darker than dark is when you think it's not dark. When you think you could see. Mesilai Sharim writes, there's two types of darkness. He writes this in his uh, trait of Zehirut, to be careful, when he talks about doing a cheshbon nefesh He says that the world that we live in is choshech, but there's two types of choshech, there's two types of darkness. There's a dark that you can't see, and then there's a worse dark, where you think that the pole in front of you is your friend, and you walk over and you walk into it. That's even worse. When it's dark, you know to be careful, you know to walk slow. There's an interesting t- statistic that Rabbi Bernstein brings over here. What is the time of the day that most accidents happen? Anyone know? Most automobile accidents. Very good job. Dusk. Not night. Because at night, you know you need to turn on your headlights. You know you need extra light. But at dusk, there's still light outside. And really, you can't see so clearly. But because there's a little bit of light, it's actually even more dangerous. And you're fooled into thinking you don't need to turn on your headlights. All the Galuyot, my friends, Bavel, Purim, the one that we're in now, the Jewish people knew they were in trouble. They knew it was dark. They said, we have to be careful. When we're going out in shackles, when Haman's trying to kill us in Rome, we know it's dark, we know it's dangerous. We know we have to be careful. But there's one thing that's darker than that, that's even more dangerous when you don't know to be careful, when you're not sure, should I be careful? Do I need to be careful? You know when that is? That is, my friends, the Galut of Chanukah. The Greeks come with enlightenment. The Greeks come with wisdom. We weren't sure what's wrong. It's a beautiful thing. We're very lucky that we have the Greeks. Matter of fact, many Jews were Hellenized because they didn't know to be careful because it was dusk. When it's dark, I could put up my, I could put on my headlights. I could turn on, make sure that I'm careful. When it's the black tunnel, I know to feel. But a mirror maze, I could see. Walk right ahead. And that is darker than dark. That's the most dangerous choshech that there is, because you're not sure, you're not aware that you need to be careful. Darker than not seeing is not realizing that you can't see. Other Galuyot, we were in trouble, we knew it. But in Chanukah, the Jews didn't realize. And then a group of Jews came, the Maccabees, and they said, this is not light. This is darkness. This is the worst darkness that exists. In an interesting way, and again, I don't want to get too deep into this topic, but many times, many times, a person is deciding on a certain school where to put their kids, and you have to put your kids in a certain school. And sometimes the ideal school is not an option. And um, sometimes a person, a parents may decide to put their kid in a school that could cater to their child. And you know, you wonder, well, there's two options. There's a public school, a non-Jewish school, and there's a school that is Jewish, but it doesn't have our values. And sometimes in an interesting way, parents prefer 
to actually go to the non-Jewish school. And again, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Always, you have to speak to your rabbi. But you could hear how in a, in a weird way, maybe actually going to a non-Jewish school could be better than going to a Jewish school that's going to teach the wrong values. Because in a non-Jewish school, your son comes home, your daughter comes home, and you say, this is not us. This is wrong. We don't do that. They know it. they're not Jews and we don't act like them and we don't think like them. And whatever they're trying to indoctrinate us with, whatever values are shoving down our minds, the kid could say, okay, they're different, they're goyim. But to be in a Jewish school and then to have to explain to your child, well, we don't do that, we don't believe that, we don't think like that. Well, what do you mean? They're Jewish. It's, it's a much harder, harder line, divide, to appreciate, to understand if your kid especially... And again, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you which one ultimately is better. But I'm saying that you could hear that there's actually a, a bigger danger. That's, that's the point of Chanukah. Chanukah, there's a bigger danger to be with the Greeks because there's so much wisdom, because there's so much light, or at least because there's enough light that you think that you're not in the dark. And that's when the most accidents happen. Hashem should bless us to be able to always follow the wisdom of the Torah. We should use our intellect, but to know that ultimately the intellect, the, the, the wisdom of God surpasses all. We'll stop over here, everyone. And by the way, the menorah, the menorah in the Bet HaMikdash had, and we light the menorah in Chanukah, the menorah had seven branches, corresponding to the seven branches of wisdom, but all the branches were pointed to the middle. Ultimately to be subservient, ultimately to bow to the wisdom of the middle branch the branch of the Torah. Hashem should bless us to always follow the Torah. The Torah comes from the word Or. To always be able to follow the true light that we have, the compass of the Torah in our lives. We'll stop over here. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom. God willing, we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.